Hello, and welcome back to the Meraki Unbox podcast. My name is Sammy Brenner, and I am taking us through today's episode. Super excited to actually be at the Meraki headquarters in San Francisco recording with our guests in person today, um, and uh, can't wait to take you through the episode. Quick housekeeping reminder, if you have ideas or you want to contribute to the Meraki Unbox podcast, please tweet us at Meraki Simon. We'd love to collaborate. We'd love to work with you if it makes sense. If you have a guest in mind, if you want to be the guest, if you have ideas, let us know. Um, tell all your friends and family about this podcast. Be sure if you haven't already done so, subscribe, download, share the podcast. We want as many listeners as possible. So we appreciate you sticking with us and uh, being a loyal listener. So transitioning into today's guest, let me go ahead and introduce her. So Annie Shane has been with Cisco for about 22 years now, uh, but she came to Meraki just about four months ago as the director of the global of global service provider sales. A little career background. So she started at Cisco as a sales associate and she spent 10 years as an account manager. Uh, she was eventually promoted into a regional manager role leading a team of collaboration, video, and enterprise networking sales specialists for the America's Service Provider Theater. Then, for the next eight years, Annie held various leadership roles in the Global Service Provider Specialist Organization, supporting the largest WebEx and Broadsoft managed services opportunities with customers like AT&T, Verizon, Lumen. Then in 2020, Annie pivoted uh, into the role of Director of Sales Strategy for America's Service Provider Theater. And all of these experiences combined really helped prepare Annie to, to lead Cisco's fastest growing global managed services business with Meraki. Uh, Annie is based in the Bay Area. She is an avid Bay Area sports fan. Go Niners, go Giants. Um, and she spends her weekend with her three young children, coaching soccer, supervising Lego builds, hiking, and getting outside for an occasional run. Annie, welcome to the Cisco Meraki podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me here. Of course. We're so excited to have you. We had a, uh, some audio issues getting on and joining the call, but now we're here. I see the smile on your face. I'm so excited to get into it with you today. Um, I always like this question. Annie, tell us, what is your story and how did you get into technology? Sounds good. So I grew up here in Silicon Valley. I um, was constantly surrounded by technology. My dad worked for Hewlett Packard and, uh, and some of the Hewlett Packard spinoffs. Um, my neighbors all worked for Cisco. So it was really just part of um, my DNA and how I grew up. I went to UCLA and I majored in economics and was trying to figure out my senior year what was next and what I wanted to do. Um, I think being in LA, I wanted to do something maybe in entertainment or something in fashion. And I met up with my um, next door neighbor who was an executive at Cisco uh, when I was home for Thanksgiving and we went on a run together and had a chat about um, what I wanted to do for my career. And I talked to him about fashion. I talked to him about um, moving to New York. And he was like, okay, Annie, so let's play this out. You're gonna move to New York, um, get like an internship or some low level job with a fashion company and um, you know, make not enough money to survive basically and um, the lifestyle that that would be. He's like, what if there was a job where you would, that you'd be really good at and you actually made enough money that you could just buy whatever you wanted, like all the fashion, all the fancy brands, all the things that you wanted. Um, what do you think about that? And I was like, that sounds good. Um, tell me more. And he was starting a program for Cisco called the Cisco Sales Associates Program, uh, required a year of training in North Carolina. And my first instinct was North Carolina, what? Um, after being in Los Angeles for four years. Um, but basically he convinced me to do it and just looked at the overall career opportunity and looked at it again as like a one-year um, 
add on to college almost, you know, being there with 60 other recent college graduates and an additional year of learning about technology and sales and coming out and having like a really good sales job, making a lot of money, a lot more money than a 20, 21 year old should be able to make. So um, that's how I ended up in, in Cisco and it's been a fun ride. Wow. I, I know sometimes we go to college and we have these aspirations and we think we want to do something with our career and we land in a totally different field. So that's interesting. It sounds like right place, right time, and definitely the right networking on your part to get to Cisco. That's very cool. So let's take a step back because before we get into your Cisco and your time at Cisco and, and the whole kind of lens and service provider in general, for those listeners, Annie, who might not even be at Cisco or Meraki, Tell us, like, what is a service provider? How do you, because I know that phrase means something different, right, in every industry. So, like, can you kind of give us, like, a service provider 101? Sure. And it's, and it's even different um, at Meraki versus Cisco. So, it's, um, it is somewhat of an ambiguous term. But at the very basic level, a service provider is a business who offers a service to their end customers. So, a service, not an actual hardware product. Most often it's a broadband service when you're looking at it from a technology perspective, a broadband service, a mobile phone service, cable service. Um, those are the most traditional types of service providers from the Cisco Meraki context. Um, but Cisco also considers software as a service, data center as a service. Um, Cisco, on the Cisco side, web companies and media companies fall into our service provider space because they are building out these massive data center networks like Disney Plus and uh, for companies like Microsoft building out Azure so that those are actually being considered service providers as well. One key thing that's very interesting about the service provider space is a lot of times when you're looking at commercial and enterprise, even public sector businesses, you're looking at them based on how many employees they have and <clears throat> the size and success for service providers is more based on how many users they have, how many subscribers do they have. Um, so that's one of the key differences that I see um, between service providers and regular businesses. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that context. That makes a lot of sense. And to your point, it is kind of a broad term, right? Depending on if you're at Cisco or Meraki or another company, like SP could mean a lot of different things. So you landed at Cisco, you built this amazing career. Talk to us about your transition over to Meraki. So what was uh, interesting to you about taking on this global service provider role at Meraki? Like, why was it exciting for you? Um, so in my previous role, I was leading a strategy team and I worked on a project really closely with our partner organization around managed services. And it really opened my eyes to the opportunities that uh, Meraki was leading and that Meraki was really um, Cisco's fastest growing and biggest managed services offer that we had. And uh, so I was excited about it and um, and was, as I was looking at my next move, I was looking for something in that managed services space and the Meraki role opened up just at the right time. So I had a conversation with Hope, uh, who's my boss right now, Hope Galley, and um, was really excited to become part of her leadership team. Um, in my 22 years at Cisco, I've never had a female leader, uh, direct manager, uh, which is pretty crazy, um, but it wow. also speaks to the, um, the service writer space is is um, skewed much uh, much more male dominated, I think, than the traditional business at Cisco. But um, talking to Hope, I was really excited about actually working for a female leader, a strong female leader, and really coming to Meraki, which felt like being where the action is in a in a big growth market and in a global role. Yeah, awesome. Well. We're so excited to have you. And that's insane that in 22 years at Cisco, this is your first female leader is over at Meraki. Love to hear it. Okay. So now that you're several months into the role, you made the transition about four months ago. Um, maybe tell us what's like something surprising or that you've learned, you know, now that you're here at Meraki um, in, in this SP role. Um, there wasn't a ton that surprised me. I've known a lot of people from Meraki over the years, and 
I did a lot of research um, prior to the role to try and make sure I understood everything. So not a ton of surprises uh, from, I think, um, just from an administrative perspective, it was interesting to me that Meraki does a lot of things differently than Cisco, even down to like applications using Google versus Microsoft, um, getting a new laptop, different types of um, VPN tools and other things like that. Um, so that was interesting, just that um, they really were continuing to run as their own company. Um, at one point, when I first uh, entered into the service provider space with architectures, I joined um, Tanberg following our acquisition of them, and it was very, very quickly assimilated into Cisco, and they changed everything to get aligned with Cisco, and it seems like Meraki hasn't done that. So that was a big surprise of just the autonomy and, uh, and the way that they've really fought to preserve um, the Meraki brand and culture within this acquisition. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something super unique and what's so appealing about you know Cisco Meraki is that even though we were acquired back in 2012, we really kept that um, that ability to stay agile. And as we migrate and become closer to Cisco, we still have a lot of autonomy and run differently. So that's interesting that you've noticed that too, but I absolutely hear that from folks coming over from Cisco is, is part of the draw, right? Is that we are a little bit more agile, we're still smaller and you can get things done quickly. Um, you know, Annie, as you've had extensive experience selling and working in this like service provider segment, um, what's something like strategically that really excites you about SP specifically? Um, you know, it was our fastest, it's one of our fastest growing segments at Meraki. Can you kind of talk about why we're experiencing such massive growth in this segment particularly? Yeah, I think um, one thing that's very clear about our service providers and the service provider route to market is the amount of scale that these SPs have. The top five SPs in the United States have over 100,000 salespeople. Um, so just massive sales force, bigger sales force than Cisco, bigger sales, sales force than Meraki in a lot of cases. And when you look at our largest, Meraki's largest VAR, they have 3,600. So it really is just showing how if we invest in getting all of these salespeople from these service providers, telling the Meraki story and leading with Meraki, how much um, how much scale you can get from something like that and how it really is like a force multiplier of our efforts by training out those people and then they train people and then um, and then they're all going out and selling that. So I think that that's one of the most um, exciting things about the service writer space is just the number of people that they have. Um, the other one I would say is that new customer acquisition is very high. So trying to get a customer signed up with you is probably the hardest cost. It's easier to upsell them once you have them. And part of the magic of doing business with service providers is they have an existing captive customer base, not just a customer base, but a customer base that has an active subscription billing in place with them currently. So they are charging this customer and the customer's already set up to pay them a monthly service cost. So when they're going out and talking to them, it is not getting something brand new set up. It's like, hey, do you wanna add security to that? Have you thought about adding wireless or expanding your internal network? And by the way, we can manage that whole thing. So it's um, it makes it a lot easier for them to offer those managed services versus the traditional VARs who are starting um, with the initial customer acquisition part of it. The other one is customer relevancy. So I would say in, especially in the SMB space, customers don't care what vendor provides their router to their home. They don't even care which vendor, not to their home, to their small office. They don't even care or know a lot of times who provides their Wi-Fi service or their switching. They get it from AT&T. They get it from Comcast or Verizon or BT. Um, so when you ask them, you know, who they're using, they they think that it's a service branded from the service provider, and they don't really have a lot of vendor preference, especially down market for one vendor versus another. And so some of these SPs will mix and match even sometimes. But if we can get the SPs to lead with our product, the customer is not buying from Cisco, they're buying from their service provider. And so that is um, an interesting way that they go to market. I think 
In the U.S., we do see a little bit more brand preference around vendors, especially as you start to go up market. But when you look at uh, even Canada, LATAM, Europe, and, and Asia, um, it is – it is really led, their connectivity is led by the service providers and they own those discussions and they're leading those discussions already. So I, I feel like I've, I've asked people like, do you know who provides your home router or your home cable modem? I have no idea what vendor that is for my house. And I know that I get it through Xfinity because that's the only provider, that's the only provider uh, in, my, in my location. So those are some of the reasons I think that we're seeing a lot of success and a lot of growth right now in the service provider spaces because they're just so well positioned uh, with their customers to add services onto their existing broadband. Right, exactly. And I think that piece you mentioned around net new customer acquisition, it's so much easier right through a service provider because you're not starting from ground zero. They already have that relationship baked in. So when we're looking at like a Meraki net new customer, if you go through the SP route, I'm sure the numbers for net new acquisition are much higher. Um, so that's a very like interesting piece of it. Yeah, um, I would say especially in like the down market, the very small like 10 employees, 20 employees, those are customers that Cisco doesn't touch. Meraki doesn't ever touch those customers. That is too far down market. RSPs are already having those conversations with them and they are already having um, all of the, um, the, they have the them signed up as a customer already. So it's an easy discussion. They're touching white space that we would otherwise not be touching at all. Right, right. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you for shedding light on that. You know, I'm curious, as we uh, dig in a bit more and talk about like Cisco Meraki's overall strategy and how we go to market in the service provider realm, can you shed some light on what has been our strategy? You were mentioning all the reasons why we've seen this massive growth in, you know, service provider, the service provider space. Annie, did you come into Meraki with kind of a strategy already baked out in your head of how you wanted to go to market? Have things changed in the last four months that you, you know, pivoted on? I guess, um, what is kind of like the overall arching strategy that you see in place for Cisco Meraki as we move forward and move up market? Yeah, I think it's, um, my strategies have definitely changed. I think when you're interviewing for a role, you you know want to paint a vision, and then once you're actually in the seat, it's like reality hits, and this is things that you can actually do. Within the service provider space, there's three, dis there's probably four distinct motions that we have. Um, we talk about service creation, so that is the act of like meeting with the service provider, getting them to agree to onboard your offer, getting it on their catalog getting it built into their systems, getting them signed up as a Cisco partner if they're not already signed up as a Cisco partner. Uh, so there's a lot of effort that goes into that one piece of just getting it into their catalog. And then they have, you know, 10,000 salespeople that have been selling a competitive product. So how do we take it from getting it onto an offer that they can sell to getting all of those salespeople able to and wanting to lead with Meraki and selling Meraki. And so that part is they, we call it sales acceleration. So going out and actually training the sales teams and building incentives and competitions and anything that we can do to get them to have a brand preference for Meraki. And then in sales execution is the final step. And that really is more upmarket where we are working directly with the enterprise teams and commercial teams to match the service providers with the offers that those teams need. So asking those teams to say, find out who offers, who your primary service provider is for your account. And then we can start talking to them about what offers they have from Meraki and making sure that they're leading with Meraki and partnering with us. So we have those three main motions. Um, but once you actually get into the business, and that's the same for collaboration, it's the same for Meraki, it's the same across all the different types of managed services offers that we have. Um, once we get into the business at Meraki, I think one thing that we've discovered is that where we're able to see the growth and where we want to really invest is in that velocity space, in the white space, in the small to medium business, and letting our service providers really do what they do best in that space and just scale and talk to those customers and getting them on board in the SMB space. 
there is a big play that we have up market, especially in retail chains and all of, you know, all of the standard uh, verticals that Meraki plays in. But where we look at where we're going to see the most long-term growth and building you know, a loyal customer base, it's going to be in that down market velocity space is where we're really investing. Got it. Okay, that's super interesting um, that the focus is small to medium, right? That's like where you really want to scale and where you really think SP can have the biggest impact. I think a lot of companies or we talk about up market, right? And always going up, up, up and enterprise. And yes, that's super important to get to, but it sounds like the sweet spot and where you think SP can make the biggest impact is that small to medium. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Kind of a, a different approach to what we hear sometimes. Um, and I, I think, Annie, that brings us into the next question I have for you perfectly, um, which is why is Cisco Meraki and our portfolio, why is that such a great fit for SP? And you mentioned some of it, right? Meraki is um, scalable and easy to use and not as complex, right? But really powerful technology. I mean, what's kind of been the talk track for like why Cisco Meraki is you're trying to break through to these SP sellers? Um, yeah, I think that it's really offering SPs, the offer that we have for our service providers is happy customers. So we want them to have happy, loyal customers that are going to renew their contracts. So I think when we look at Meraki overall renewal rates up in like the mid 90%, I think that's something that's very attractive to them, knowing that they, if they sell their customer Meraki, it's going to continue to grow and uh, and continue to renew and their customers are going to be happy. They love the simplicity of it. Um, and SPs love how easy it is to manage. So we do have our own challenges with our managed services platform, but compared to our competitors, we have a very easy system to manage. The other area I would say is that many of our competitors are point products. And so where Meraki can really differentiate is the ability for them to invest and get their customers signed up on the platform. It's a platform approach. It's the same thing that we're, you know, all selling every day inside of Meraki managed services and in regular direct sales, but the platform. So being able to sell them one piece of that, getting them used to the management and the overall platform look and feel of that, and then adding it on. And so being able to sell them not just a SD-WAN node, but also wireless switching and now cameras and IOT and all these things. It's a very easy upsell for the service providers to be able to just start to grow their offer with their customer, which ultimately makes them more profitable because they're not having to invest in installing an entirely additional platform, an additional management platform for them. So I'd say over the long run, they're going to make more money with Cisco than they with more, Cisco and Meraki than they would with any of our other competitors. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a really important call out. And to your point, it's the same talk track that our sellers are saying to their partners and their local VARs, right? Is is Meraki's not a single product, it's an entire portfolio, right? It's a suite um, and really driving home that messaging. I guess, you know, all all sellers and, and, and folks in the industry have adapted the way that we've sold and we're needing to sell due to the you know global pandemic and challenges and in inventory. I mean, what are we seeing? Are you seeing some of those like repeatable trends within SP? Like, is there um, a common theme of, of a challenge that you guys have, have come up to when you're selling into these accounts? Kind of what are some of the hurdles, I guess, your your teams had to overcome in the last couple months? Yeah, I think it's the months. same. It's the same across across all of Meraki, that we're all struggling with some of the lead time challenges. And one of the things that we are encouraging our customers to do is just place orders early, again, just like everyone else. A program that we built um, a few years ago for the Velocity space into the SMB was an option to let our service providers procure bulk equipment. So basically they would buy a bunch of a specific SKU, put it in a warehouse, and then again, because it's targeting this, it's targeting the sub 100 users. So they have to fill out a contract and agree that they're going to only sell this bulk equipment to customers under 100 users. They're not becoming a distributor. This is really focused on them, allowing them to lean into that velocity motion 
and be quick and nimble with those types of customers and be able to pull from their warehouse and just ship out, you know, 100 APs a day or 100 routers a day or 100 switches a day, things like that as needed to their customers. And the partners who have invested in that are going to see a lot of success, I think, in the coming months because they will have equipment where some of their competitors will not have equipment. And where our competitors, frankly, uh, Meraki's competitors will not have equipment either. So I think that it is, it's something that a lot of our SPs are now investing in and they all want to go up market. They all want to say, oh, can we, can we, you know, take that regulation off of here? And then our answer is no, because that makes them a distributor. And that's, you know, there's a time and a place for someone to build out a distribution model. This is really a very directed model for us to be able to target those velocity customers that need connectivity. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. And anyone who did that months ago is in a very good place now, to your point, right. <laughs> where we just don't don't have as much inventory now. Um, well, let's, I wanna, you know, we, and we have time for this, so I wanna talk to you a little bit more about the, some of the work you did at Cisco, being a part of the America Service Provider Organization. Um, I know that you and I had talked offline and you mentioned that you even helped kind of get an ERO off the ground, which is super cool. And I've talked to a lot of our listeners before about that. So Annie, can you shed a little light on the Women of America Service Provider ERO? Uh, and for those listeners who don't know, that's an employee resource group or um, that, that Annie started. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, how did you get that off the ground? How did it come about? Out and, and what was the impact that you had as part of that program at Cisco? Thanks. Yeah, I think if you look at the service provider space in general, it is not a very diverse space. Not a lot of women, not a lot of racial diversity. Um, it is somewhat old school. And we recognize the benefits of um, having a diverse workforce and that that needs to be invested in in order to achieve those benefits. And it's not something that you just say, okay, let's start hiring more, you know, diverse people. It's something that takes a lot of work. And, and then you also need to have care and feeding for the diverse people who are in your organization. And I think that that's really where part of um, launching a Women of Cisco employee resource organization came out of was there are regional, uh, Cisco has regional Women of Cisco organizations in San Jose and in New York, but having an organization of women that are in the same theater together that may not work together on a daily basis, but really being able to share experiences and build allies and build a network together was something that I felt was missing from our organization and talked to some of the other female leaders. Everyone was on board. Our leader at that time, Patrick Morrissey, was very much in favor of getting something like that launched. And so we worked on building, I think it was might have been like the first theater-based that's actually aligned to a segment ERO that we had. And so as far as getting the team together for events, it's not something that we can do in a single office because it is all throughout Canada, the US and Latin America. But we do a lot of virtual events, um, bring in female executives from our customers to talk to us about their experiences. We've had some coaches come in and talk about um, different ways that females can differentiate differentiate themselves from a career perspective. We have our leaders come on and, and um, subject them to some of what we joke about um, with them, where you get on a call as a female leader and everyone is talking about sports. And so we would get our leaders on the call, our male leaders, and we would talk about rom-coms or, you know, <laughs> things that are very traditionally Love more uh, female, uh, female focused. And, and I think that it really hit home. Like, I think it made them really understand some of the, um, some of the things that were, you know, we're sitting on calls and everyone's talking about the football game on Sunday and they, you, you know, as a, you know, again, this is very much the stereotype, but a lot of women, um, weren't watching it. And so it's it's trying to get them to feel what that's like. Um, but yeah, it's something that I think that we, we felt the need for. Um, we have a long way to go. And it's uh, it takes not just, again, hiring new females, but retaining female talent. And I think female talent in the technical space is in high demand right now because all the companies recognize the value that that brings to an organization. 
um, as well as racial diversity. So that's something that wasn't covered by the women of Cisco, but that's another element of, I was the executive sponsor for diversity for America's service provider uh, when I was part of that group. And so that was a big focus too, was like, how do we change the racial portfolio of, um, of what we look like? And how do we try and bring in, and how do we align with some of these EROs and make sure that our, um, our advertising, our open job roles within these EROs with Cisco, but also with these external networks. So looking at some of these external networks um, and going and looking at these events and trying to recruit people from events and not the people who are attending the events, the people who are speaking at the events. Like, let's go try and get the keynote speaker from a you know diverse organization and try and get them to come and be an executive over in our business. Um, so those are some of the things that we worked on doing and building a database of um, silver medalists that wasn't really as focused on diversity, but looking at going through an interview process. If you had anyone that went through that you thought was a superstar candidate, but they weren't perfect for the role that you were looking for, building an internal database that we could search through of what we called silver medalist candidates that we could kind of hone in on our own. Those were another thing that we worked on, but lots of different activities there to try and change the face of service provider. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for speaking to that. And I think uh, the fact that you have thought about that so much already, right, at Cisco, and that was part of kind of a what you championed for and took on and bringing that over to Meraki is hugely important. So let me ask you now, I mean, you are a director, right, of the global service provider sales role here at Meraki. What have you kind of taken from Cisco and brought over as a leader in terms of those elements of thinking about DS, uh, DNI and thought diversity and gender diversity and racial diversity, right? Like all of the things, like what kind of how have you honed that as a sales leader and how do you think about that when you're hiring now? So I've only been in the role for four months. I haven't had to hire anyone yet, but I, hopefully I will. Hopefully we'll get some more head yes. count. Um, I would say it's, we are very lucky at Meraki that Meraki not only already has a more diverse organization, but I think the culture of it attracts a more diverse population as well having some of these inside sales organizations that are really kind of feeders into the eventual field that sales organizations, I think also helps because you're getting people that don't necessarily have a technology background and someone that seems like they are a good salesperson. Like let's get this person into Meraki and then let's try and build out a path for them where they can see their career growth and doing that with a focus on diverse employees, I think is something that Meraki's, I don't know if there's, I'm sure there's been a focus on it, but it almost seems like it's just come naturally to the company here. So it is something that um, I haven't jumped headfirst into with Meraki yet because I'm still trying to get my feet under me, but it is something that I would love to be more involved with as, uh, as I continue my career here at Meraki. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure, yeah, like you said, you're only four months in, but I'm sure you'll do hiring, a lot of hiring before you know it. Um, but yeah, I run the global ADR org. So our, our sellers feed right into the inside team who you'll eventually probably hire from. So we're all working together in one way or another. Um, well, Annie, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have one more question and then we'll wrap it up and, and do a couple fun rapid fires at the end. But let's say someone is listening to this podcast today is feeling inspired by our conversation. They want to learn more about SP. They want to get involved somehow, whether they're in our organization or outside. What's like a good jumping off point if someone is is curious and wants more information and, and potentially wants to explore getting into the service provider realm? So we would love to have good people coming into our team from the service provider space. And and I am hopeful that we will be doing hiring in the future. So I would say for people within Meraki or Cisco or people even outside, if they have an interest, uh, they can reach out to me. I can direct them to their regional leader, whether it's the one in US or in Europe, just to start networking. I think networking and learning more. If you are like an enterprise or commercial or even in, uh, in the smaller business space at Meraki, uh, find out who your customer service provider is 
and reach out to them and strategize about an opportunity. I think that they are often, sometimes there's downside to working with them because the perception is, is that the margins that they um, take on reselling our product are high. But the reason they're high is because it's bundling a managed service offer in there. And they're often able to have leverage over bandwidth and all these other services that are being purchased by them to actually make the overall net cost of ownership less for your customer. So uh, they're very open to partnering with us and strategizing with us. And if we're not reaching out, a lot of times they're going rogue and they're talking to the customers anyway. And so if we engage them and we have a Meraki practice with them, then that will help. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So ask, open mouths get fed, right? Ask and be curious. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, cool. So let's do a couple rapid fire questions if you're open to it, Annie. Are you down? Sure, yeah. Okay, let's do it and then we'll close out. Um, this is one of my favorites. What is your favorite meal of all time? I have to say it's a mission burrito. And oh. by mission burrito for people outside of San Francisco, it's just a part of San Francisco that makes really good burritos. And that's, um, yeah, I could eat a burrito every day. <laughs> uh, same. It's a problem. Um, first concert. What was the first concert you ever attended? Um, the first real concert, I think I did one at Great America. Um, but the first like real concert I went to was in excess and it was, it's called their get out of the house tour. For anyone that is in the Bay area, it was at the Warfield, which is like a very small venue. And I'm dating myself with this, but we meet as I was a freshman in high school and we actually camped out overnight in front of the blockbuster, um, in order to get the tickets. And that's something that, you know, in the age of technology, now you don't have to do, but that was, and to this day, I think it still is probably one of the best concerts I've ever been to. Oh my gosh. That's so amazing. Camping in front of blockbuster. That's commitment right there. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, if you could eat one meal with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Um, I mean, I think, like, personally, it would be probably like my grandma, who I love and who, you know, passed away many, many years ago and just kind of letting her know where I am in my life and that I am married and have three kids because she'd always ask me about when I'm going to get married and settle down, just like – you know, your grandmas probably do. So I want to make sure she knows that. Um, if I was going to say someone famous, I think a woman who has always inspired me that I would, um, that I would have loved to have sat down and have a meal with is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So RBG, oh, yeah. a fan of hers, especially in the light of what's going on in the world today. Yeah. Yeah. RBG would be a, a nice person to chat with when she, yeah. Great answer. And then last one, what, uh, what would you say, Annie, is like your favorite movie that makes you laugh? Like if you need a good laugh, what movie are you going to watch? Zoolander. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. Wow. I, I love that's it. A, that's top one. That was that's a perfect like the most quoted in my family. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Meraki Unbox podcast. It was wonderful to chat with you and hear your story and learn more about Meraki's SP strategy. Um, so appreciate you joining. And uh, we will close out today's episode. Make sure you, again, download, subscribe, and we will be back here in two weeks with another episode of the podcast. Take care, everyone, and have a great day.